Welcome. This time, we invite you to a casual conversation about coffee with our fellow industry professionals. In contrast to our other podcast material, this is not an interview, but an open dialogue about all things coffee, where we put focus on the guest's current interests and passion. We hope that you will enjoy this just as much as we did recording it. Thank you for listening. Welcome, guys. Um, we're doing things a bit differently here now. We're actually in Taipei, Taiwan. Yes. Um, we're going to brew some coffee. So we're actually going to do this a bit more laid back than usual. I'm here uh, with my good friend, April athlete, Eric. Um, we're going to talk a lot about him, what he's doing. Uh, and we're going to brew some, some different coffees using some different gadgets. I have the April Brewer uh, with me here. Uh, and we're just, just going to talk to you guys at the same time, basically recording, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, Eric, which I already asked you. We had some issues with the recording at the beginning, so we started over here. Yeah. Um, let's share how we, how we met. Okay. That's the current story, right? Yeah. So, firstly, welcome. Uh, welcome to Taiwan. Um, so, about the story that we met, it was actually happening in 2016 or 17. I couldn't really remember correctly. Um, I'm going to say seven, 16. Yeah, it's 16, I guess. Yes. Yeah, 16. Yeah. So in 2016, um, I was still studying in England, and then I attended an event in Estonia, the, roast, the roasting camp, and I think it's the first roasting camp in Europe. Uh, I participated in Patrick's workshop, uh, but before that, I have seen him in a few events already. Um, and then I remember that time that you came to me and said, oh, you seem to know everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then I was like, uh, yeah, I was staying in Europe for a while. And then I participated in your event, uh, your workshop, which is talking about quality control. That's true. We did a, we did a quality control uh, workshop discussing how we can make tasty coffee, right? Yes. And uh, I remember that very clearly because people got really angry uh, or... Like half of the people got really angry, half of the people <laughs> got, got pretty happy. But what we did was that we basically did our presentation first about coffee roasting, and then we set up a cupping. Yes. And we uh, had everyone evaluate this pretty serious with like notes and all of it. Yes. And that took like an hour, and everyone had these ideas about, you know, how do we roast these coffees differently, and what yeah. kind of different coffees was it? Yeah. And then we sat down, and we had like a fairly minute long discussion about all of these different coffees and all the different roast profiles of the coffees yeah. uh, and I asked everyone so how many different coffees are on the table yeah. and it turned out that all of the coffees were from the exact same batch yeah. exact same coffee yeah. um, they were just either grinded or dosed a bit differently right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so here we have all of these experienced roasters thinking that they're tasting all of these different profiles yeah. and pitching what someone actually did different in the different roasts where in reality it was the same coffee, right? <laughs> Just trying to highlight the importance of what we're doing now, brewing, right? Yes. What we're doing in terms of brewing affects how the coffee tastes. Yes, right? definitely. Pretty straightforward. Yes. Um, but you, you have done a lot more stuff since the first time I saw you. you yeah. You've been busy. Yes, yes. What have you been up to? Um, so actually after um, coming back to Taiwan, I set up the roastery. It's called Nighting Coffee Roasting Lab. It is a small scale roastery. Um, and at that time, my girlfriend Lily competed in the Brewers Cup, uh, which at the same time I was uh, doing the military service. I was trying to compete myself, but uh, I couldn't. Um, but Lily did. And I was roasting coffee for her. And at the end, she got the third. Uh, which we were very happy because it was the first time as a team that we competed. Um, but at the same time, there is something that I, I'm unhappy about, is the grain bean sourcing. Because um, we had to buy the coffee from Taiwanese suppliers, definitely. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, we didn't have a lot of choices. And the information transparency was not really well, I would say. So after the competition, I was thinking if there could be a chance that I can source some grain and at the same time um, to provide better transparency to our clients, that would be a good, um, a good, good thing in Taiwan or maybe in Asia. So at the end, I was very lucky that 
um, two of my partners, um, they offer me the opportunity to say, hey, we're actually having this coffee. Would you be willing uh, to join us? Mm. So actually, the brand called Try Up is starting with three people. Ah, OK. Yeah, so that's three people today now. Oh, we're still three people. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which is a very cool story to talk about. Yeah. Um, and then starting from that point, we source the coffee we have. Uh, we source the coffee ourselves. And we flew to Origins, which is super cool. And I started to compete in 2018. Um, I got a second place. And in 2019, I competed again and got a second place again, uh, which was also good. But we're not really satisfied with the result. And yeah. we want to improve. It's time to go go back in and, and win, right? Yeah. Uh, which is this is also why we're, we're really happy to have Eric and Board uh, interested in the athletes as well. Yeah. Um, and hopefully we're we're able to kind of put together the missing missing people, yeah. missing pe uh, pieces of the puzzle. But I mean, we should also state that you're competing in Taiwan, and we we talked about this earlier today because <laughs> uh, we've been about well, I mean, we've been spending a lot of time uh, together driving around eating mainly a lot of food, yeah. also drinking some cool <clears throat> coffee yes, um, yes. around the, the southern parts of Taiwan. Yeah. Uh, but I think you mentioned, you mentioned something about how many times Taiwan has been in the world final yes. in relationship to how many times they competed. Yes. So I think um, the Burst Cup um, have been held for, have been holding for like seven or eight years now. The first event, um, Taiwan got in to get the fifth place. And the second year, we didn't get into the final. But starting from the third year, um, Chad, the world champion, competed the first time. And he got the third place. And then the next year, he got the first. Then um, it's 2018. So it was the year that I competed. Yeah. Uh, the champion got the fourth place. And then this year, I competed again. And the champion got the fifth place in yeah. the world. So actually, competing in Taiwan is very, I would say, very competitive. Yeah. And you, if you win, you will have a lot of pressure because, <laughs> because everyone is expecting you to get into the final. Yeah, yeah. that's very true. And we, we talked with uh, uh, Ben Bud on this podcast uh, a few weeks back in Shanghai as well. And we, we referenced and talked about what he referred to as conversion rates. Yes. Right? So certain countries, if you win, you're going to have to practice a lot to, yeah. to have a fighting chance in the world championship. Yeah. Uh, other countries, it's kind of if you win there, you can almost take exactly what you've done there yeah. and just bring it, bring it into the world championship, right? Yes. And that's kind of where we see um, Taiwan today, right? Which yes. obviously also makes it more difficult to win. It is very um, difficult. <laughs> that being said, I mean, if you want to win the world, if your ultimate goal is to win the world championships, yeah. you're going to have to beat these kind of people um, anyway, right? Yeah. Uh, which I think is really cool. Uh, part of this, and also on your kind of green coffee journey here, uh, we're going to brew some coffee during this time as well, which is going to be a bit noisy. Uh, bear with us. Hopefully, we are going to say some interesting stuff about the coffees. Yes. Um, but why not? I mean, you've been competing now for a few times. Yes. Let's talk about competition coffee. Yes. What is a competition coffee to you? I mean, what does that mean, both in terms of you know, how important is the story? Yeah. Uh, do you have any preference in terms of countries? Um, and what are you looking for in that kind of cup profile in terms yeah. of what you're serving the dinners? Yeah. Um, so after a few years competing, I found out that you definitely need to choose the coffee that you like. But at the same time, don't choose the coffee that you like too much. You have to look at the score sheet as well. So the first year, um, sorry that I didn't tell you, but 2015 or 2014, I actually competed the first time. That was when I got back from Europe and then I knew nothing about coffee. But I competed anyway. And I took a coffee from Tim Vendable. Nice. <laughs> it's a semi wash Brazilian. Oh, wow, that was a long time ago. I haven't seen a Brazilian coffee on Tim Vendable's menu in a very long time. Yeah, and so I took that coffee and then brew like. Um, I, I think the trend thing is to have high extraction rate. So I did the same. Uh, I like the coffee very much. But maybe I was a little bit too hardcore <laughs> to bring the Brazilian um, semi-wash. But of course, like Emmy did it uh, to win the to win the competition. She, she did. I mean, a while, a while you know later, and decided different character to it. But uh, she definitely did. And I think yeah. that's, that's important to to 
to remember as well. Brazilian copies can yeah. be amazing, and we've seen that, right? Yeah. And at the same time, um, you really have to consider your judge as a um, regular customer. They are experts, but you have to consider them as a regular customer. So when I choose my competition coffee, I starting from the customer point. Uh, I don't want something that to be described as some um, too complex. I mean, of course, you're going to choose a complex coffee because you can get more points uh, if you describe it perfectly or at least like accurate. Um, but standing on the viewpoint of a customer, um, if I know you the first time and then I'm listening to your whole theory, I want to know that I can experience this coffee um, with you. So starting from that viewpoint, um, and then I got the chance to source the coffee myself. First of all, I really would like to choose one coffee that I like. But at the same time, I want to make the connection to my judges, my customers, to the coffee, and to me myself. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, I think that's very important. On, on the subject of, of sourcing the coffee um, yourself, because uh, if I remember correctly, in, in your case, that means yeah. actually visiting the farm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's something that I discuss a lot with people competing and it's something that people, it, it's a common excuse to some degree not compete because I haven't visited a farm or yeah. I don't have time to visit a farm. Yeah. People think they have to visit a farm. Uh, what are the kind of, what's the key points there? Is it a lot easier to compete when you've been at the farm? Yeah. Does it actually make a difference? Yeah. Or is the most important part that you have that really tasty coffee? I would argue that, um, it's both right and both wrong. Yeah. Um, so for me, like, you need to find your connection with the coffee. And then you show your connections to the judges and to make them connect to your stories, yeah. which is very important because you want to be unique on stage. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, like, um, of course, it will be easier uh, that you have um, super nice coffee, delicious coffee, and easy to describe. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I think that you need to have a connection with this coffee to really showcase a good story. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say that maybe both. But visiting a farm, I wouldn't say it's a must. As long as you have a good stories and maybe you like the stories a lot, you, you, you like this coffee a lot, and you know how the taste is from, you know more about the information of this coffee, and then you feel really connected. Then when you go on stage, you can actually show your stories and show your passion in this coffee. Then I think that's all. You don't have to visit the farm yourself. I, to I totally agree with that. I mean, having obviously competed with coffees where, where I have visited the farm and yeah. also competed with coffees where, where I haven't. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that it really comes back to what you're saying about you need to con connect to the coffee. Yes. Um, you can do that in a lot of different ways. I yes. don't think you have to be at the farm. Yeah. Does it help to be at the farm? Uh, maybe, but it works the opposite way as well. As in, I've seen a lot of competitors going to a farm, yeah. and before they even go there, they're so they have decided I'm going to take a coffee from this farm. Yes. Right. And they lose their objectivity. Yeah. And they end up using a coffee from that farm, yeah. beautiful stories, uh, maybe some pictures, but then in the end, the coffee is not tasty. Yeah, right? true. And then it doesn't matter. And yeah. for me, when it comes to competition coffees, I come back to this again and again and again and again. It's don't, one, don't choose too early. Yeah. Because if you choose four or five months before your competition, it might be amazing then, mm -hmm. but you're not competing then. Right? Yeah. You're competing five months later. So if that same coffee is not delicious, then yeah, um, then you might end up not winning because of that, right? Yeah. So I'm still a very big fan of actually choosing coffee um, almost a week before. I mean, in my mind, I have two, three coffees that I work on, and I'm definitely gonna have one coffee that I'm more set on than the other ones. But yeah. At the end of the day, when you're competing on that day, you know, it's <laughs> really tasty. Yeah. Um, let's let's kind of jump into a bit of coffee brewing here as well. We're gonna come back to this as well. Yeah. Um, what do you want to brew first? We have we have two really interesting coffees here. We just roasted on Anikawa. Yeah. Uh, basically the April uh, sample profile. Yeah. We can all find it at the Anikawa website on yeah. their blog post if yeah. anyone wants to see it. It's a really short uh, kind of five six minute long um, 
sample roast, maybe not what I recommend, but it's efficient. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's a good way to just taste the coffee. Yeah. Uh, but what, are, what, are, what should we start brewing? I would Colombian say that we, we, we the Colombian first. Yeah. Let's do that. How do you okay. want to, how do you want to brew it? We have a bunch. Eric has a lot of different equipment. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so different grinders, you have different brewers. We have, I'm just going to tell you guys, we have the April brewer here as well. Yes. So uh, we have a Lily Gripper, which is very common in Asia. Not to confuse, we did a um, uh, podcast slash video with one uh, other athlete, Gio, would had, I think that Lily Gripper comes from Colombia. Who makes that? Lily Gripper? The tiny one. The tiny the one, one you have in a V60. Uh, the Lilliger? Yeah. Uh, it's also the same company, actually. Is it the same company? I, I think so, yeah. Are you sure about that? Because the uh, font is different. Okay, if anyone listening to this knows if the tiny white thing you use to fold the V60 filter differently yeah. that we have done a YouTube video on versus the Lily Dripper, which is basically a flatbed brewer with a bunch of hole in it. Yeah. If you know if this is the same <laughs> producer or not, <laughs> just let us know and we know. I also see, funny side note, I see these. Yes. Have you had those for a long time? Um, not really. Like, um, I think my colleague is competing in the AeroPress Championship. Yeah. And I just, like, I, w I saw the newsletter. You bought it after, ah, yes. okay. So yes. he, what he has here is a stack of AeroPress filters from a company <laughs> called uh, I I see it, maybe. Yeah. Uh, made in Canada. We used them to win the Danish National Championship. Yes. Um, Eric is an athlete, which means that everything we know, he knows. So whenever we find something interesting, we send that uh, in a little newsletter to all of our athletes. Yeah. Uh, we have V60s, Kalidas. Uh, we have, you know, stainless. Uh, we have V60 Kalidas. Switch. We have V60 Switch. Uh, the latest product. Yes. Which you've been brewing with quite a bit. Yes. Uh, we Excellent. have the origami. Uh, I mean, how, how do you choose brew method? Um, Colombian, tell, tell us a bit about the coffee first. Okay, so, so, what it is. Um, so this Colombian coffee is from the farm, like a famous farm, uh, La Palma y el Tucan. Mm -hmm. And this is called the Bio Innovation um, nat Anaerobic Natural. Mm -hmm. So basically, I think Bio Innovation stands for the way that the farm um, approaches the production. So for example, they, do, they wanted to make it more sustainable. Um, they made their own fertilizer-ish. Mm. And they kind of like make the farm uh, being sustainable itself. And then still that, you know, that they are super crazy about uh, fermentation. They're mm. so kind of like geeky and they're very precise. So they have this like lactic fermentation and yeah. then basically anaerobic um, and so this is a Keshav varietal that they planted um, now it is like the eighth years yeah for the and it's really cool I mean you guys can't see that because we're not doing a video now but the I mean it's extremely well sorted yes it's really interesting we have we have a coffee here that it's extremely well sorted and we have another coffee <laughs> we're gonna brew that it's the opposite of that but we'll come to that later yeah but I mean this specific geisha looks I mean, pretty fantastic yeah very geisha like yes um, very very long beans some of the longest I've actually seen which is really cool and I mean they're as you say they're very famous for for being very good at what they do yeah okay so you have a natural anaerobic really fancy bio geisha yes some of the best stuff in the world perhaps I mean, yeah they are doing really good stuff. Yeah. Um, so roasted 30 minutes ago, 45 yeah. minutes ago on yeah. an Ikawa. Yeah. How will you brew it? Okay. With so when I choose a dripper, this is my theory. Um, Go for it. Yeah. But when I choose a dripper, I actually look back to what the coffee has itself. Oh. So I know that it is a complex coffee. Sure. Um, I wouldn't choose a cone shape dripper. I would choose a flat bed dripper. Okay. Yeah. Um, which I think that it's because of the depth you have for the grounds. If you go with a flatbed, you definitely go with uh, a shorter or like um, like a thinner bed. Yeah, like a yeah. thinner bed. And if you if you have a thicker bed, that means that you can have a kind of like a, having a better complexity uh, in my sense. And I would like to go for the little dripper or the Kalita. Okay. Um, and then it comes to the flow rate. Yeah, so which are very different. Yes, I mean, you guys should actually look into the Lily Dripper. Um, we're also gonna 
just a side note here. I think they're actually spelling it differently. Because yeah. this is Lily with an I, and yes. the other one is Lily with a Y. Yes. So I think maybe they're two different companies. Yeah. Uh, that was kind of a side note here. Mm. But what's important here is the flow rate between the Kalita and the Lily gripper is vastly different. Very different. Is it fair to say that the Lily is quite a lot faster? It's way faster. It's way faster. Yeah. Now, why do we want to brew faster? Well, if we brew faster, you can actually um, go for a finer grind. Uh, for me, the, in my theory, is that if I go with a finer grind, um, I'll definitely getting um, uh, more body. Uh -huh. And like when I say more body, it's like basically the strength is higher or heavier. So if, if I find this coffee very gentle and I want to make it a little bit sweeter and then to bring out more body, mm. then I go with Little, uh, a faster flow rate mm. because I'll grind finer and I, want, I don't want my brew time to be too long to get over extracted. Mm -hmm. So then I will go with a uh, faster flow rate dripper. On the, uh, on the opposite, if I find that um, I'm having good body or good strength enough coffee and I'll grind a little bit coarser yeah. and then to make it balanced then I'll go with a slower flow rate. Okay. So that's the way I choose for a um, for a dripper. And this one here, we're gonna push. We're gonna push the lily, you know. Yeah. Because it's fun, and it's always we're gonna do a video about the lily dripper as well. Yeah. Uh, because I discovered this in. I mean, it's an old brewer, but I discovered it in Shanghai, just a few weeks ago. Yeah. This, and I'm I'm pretty amazed over it, right? Especially since we're in the process of making our own April brewers now, which should be live on Kickstarter when you listen to this <laughs> commercial. Um, it's kind of, it's really interesting to explore new brewers. I think yeah. it's super fun, right? Yes. Um, paper filter, uh, and let's, let's stick to talking about the Kalita filters. Yes. Uh, we might have found other filters that are very interesting, but uh, that will stay in between the athletes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> until we, we uh, figure out how good they actually are. Yes. Um, so the large Kalita filter, Hey, it's fine. The little dripper. Would the small one work as well? Um, I don't know. I've, I, I always have the bigger one. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have enough water? Yes, I think so. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just going to let, so again, we're going to be a bit noisy here, but um, you're just going to brew some coffee, no? Yes. Like walk us through what you're doing here. Um, what is your ratio? Do you want me to weigh you some? Um, I want to go with 1 to 14. One to fourteen. Yes. What's the dose you want to? Uh, I want. I actually want to do more, but I would say eighteen grams is fine. Eighteen grams. Yes. That's a pretty large brew. How come you want to brew so much coffee? Um, I want to taste it. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're brewing a lot of coffee because there was a larger cup of coffee so you can taste it properly. Yeah. Which I think makes sense. But would you then do that in competition as well? Um. Probably yes, but it also depends on how much coffee I have. I mean, if I'm going to practice, it's going to be three cups a turn, like a round. Yeah. And if I have enough coffee, then I definitely would go with a larger portion. Um, and I usually go with a larger portion. Yeah. Because uh, it means that when I set up the recipe and I can play around with it um, until the final day. Yeah, but if I have a lower portion, um, you know that if you go with lower 125 or 120 moles, then you'll get disqualified. Eric is giving me shit for uh, being disqualified in my first world <laughs> because everything worked, but then I poured too little coffee in the cup, which can still be discussed since the cup was perfectly designed to Sorry. Here is giving me shit for getting disqualified. Um, I poured too little coffee in a cup, which again can be discussed, uh, but that's what I've been told. Now we ground this coffee here on what is the machine here? It's a Barazza. Of course. At the Forte. Barazza Forte. Yes. And are we grinding this fine, medium? Uh, I think it's like medium fine. It's not. It's not coarse, definitely. Yeah. It's, um, it's getting to a finer grind setting. Yeah. I want to sneak in in this conversation where I totally agree with Eric that it's, it's pretty stupid to be disqualified for not pouring <laughs> enough coffee. I mean, I, I can live with that, right? But in terms of ratios and, and amount of coffee, 
pounds of coffee. Since I tend to prefer roasting on the Akawa, yes. I want to keep my doses so I can always use one full batch yes. on the Akawa. Yes. So if I dose too much, then yes. I'm at like, let's say 20 grams. Yes. Then the way that I'm roasting on the Akawa is not going to give me enough yeah, true. beans with one batch. Yes. So for a consistency perspective, I would, I would think of it differently. Yes. Um, but then again, we still see a lot of ratios with like 20 grams of coffee as a starting, yes. starting dry dose. Um, so we've got the coffee. It smells amazing. Uh, it's a bit of a shame that you guys can actually not smell it. You want to let the, let the people know what we're smelling here? Okay. Are you using this for brewing or this? Uh, for that. Uh, that one is for cooling the water, the brew water. Okay, wait. Let, let, let's talk about this. How, how, how Cooling that water? Yes. In the kettle? Yes. Why don't you just have a lower temperature? No, I'm going to set higher temperature at front. And then for the second pour, the third pour, I'll go lower down the temperature. And then, the, okay, so we only have one, one Bonavita kettle here. Uh, so you're doing this because that's the most efficient way to lower the temperature of this water. Yes. Oh, okay. But then if you had two kettles, you would not do it. You would just have the, the other kettle on the setting. Or would you still do that? Yes. Uh, I, still th I still did that in competition. Oh, wow. So in that's really interesting. This year and last kettle. year, I had two kettles, yeah. um, and I prepared a little vessel with cold water or room temperature water. Yeah. And after I finished the first pour, yeah. I immediately uh, poured the cold water into my kettle to lower down the brew temp, and I calculated it, and then I show the judge that it, it's, it's the designed temperature. Then the question here is, why don't you just have two different temperature settings on? Oh, I have, I have. So I actually, I have three temperature settings. Are you using three different temperatures when you brew? Yes. Okay, so this is complicated. I'm going to admit that I haven't really jumped into this different temperatures in the same brew. I'm not really convinced it's a thing, uh, but but there we go. So we're going to do something with it here. Right? And he's going to just walk us through. Let's talk about the aroma here because yes. we're going to jump that. So what are we smelling? So when I the dry dose of the coffee. When I try to describe the aroma or anything else. I always go with color first. Yeah. So when I smell it, I found a little bit like yellow and reddish, yeah. which kind of reminds me a little bit of floral notes as well. But at the same time, I can find a little bit lactic. Um, we have this special drink called yogurt. So it's a little bit yogurt-like. Um, so it's kind of milky white, but it's more with a yellow color. Uh, at the same time, I found a little bit berries uh, with the red-ish color notes. Um, when I smell, I also find a little bit of the melon. Yeah. So for me, like it's more on a, I would say tropical um, fruit note. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, is fitting because we, we're basically eating fruit at the same time as we do this. Because there's some really good food in Taiwan that we don't have. <laughs> well, we have them in, in Scandinavia and it just doesn't taste very good. <laughs> Okay, so 18 grams of coffee. Yes. Uh, how much water? Oh, you said 1 to 15, so we can calculate uh, that, or you can just tell us. <laughs> uh, I'm doing 1 to 14, actually. 14? Yes. Okay, sorry, I was, I was misheard you there. Okay. 1 to 14, which so, is how much water are you pouring on? I'm not actually, 250. That, 250, okay. Yes. Cool. And I'm, the first thing that comes to my mind there is that um, that's a pretty short ratio. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, what is that ratio doing with your coffee? Uh, for me, ratio at the end will be the yield. I actually started to calculate the, the yield to the dose ratio. Okay. Um, of course, because the coffee will be retaining some moisture water inside the pack. But at the same time, it gives me a number of how much coffee that I'm going to extract. Um, so if I'm going with the longer ratio, that means I'm going to extract a little bit more. Um, but I don't really want to go too long of this coffee. I, it's slightly lighter roasted than my usual, my usual roast. Yeah. Um, but I would say that I still go with 1 to 14 to see, to stop at a good point. And sometimes my experience with the 1 to 15 is that I can find a little bit like a bitterness astringency yeah so that will indicate that maybe i go a little bit too far for the yeah. ratio 
So I use ratio to kind of like stop at the right point. Yep. And now I'm just trying to be safe. I want to enjoy this coffee a little bit more. And if the strength is too high, I would just bypass a little bit of the water. Okay, yeah. super cool. Uh, let, let's do this. Yes. You also have the new, let's talk about that at the same time, which is important. You also have the new Akaya uh, S yes. Pearl, relatively yeah. new product. Yes. We have it online at April as well. Yeah. There's no commercial. Um, what do we think about that? Um, I actually just got it a few weeks ago. Um, I didn't really have time to play around with it. I don't think that I have the flow rate uh, calculating function uh, used yet. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but I saw that in Boston. Yeah. And I think it's quite cool because you can actually practice a little bit. Yeah. Um, but I haven't really digged into this function yet. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Let's, uh, let's do some pouring. But I feel that it's a little bit more sensitive than the previous one. Yeah. Which means that it can go a little bit more it, precise. It also, it also shows you the decimal yeah. even when you see the time. Yeah. And that, that's <clears> either a really nice thing so you can be more accurate or a really annoying thing to have when you compete because it's going to be very difficult to pour identical. True. But that can be discussed in another other episode. Okay. So we're starting with a circle pour. Uh, how much are we going to pour? 45. 45. So the difference between me and Eric here when it comes to coffee brewing is that he still believes in the concept of coffee blooming, <laughs> uh, which basically is let's pour a smaller amount of coffee in the beginning of the brew to allow the coffee to be gas. Yes. Um, let's talk about that later. Let's just continue the pouring. And I'll yes. I'll kind of share. How, how long are you blooming here? 35 seconds. 35 seconds. Yes. Why 35 and not 30 or 40 or 32? It actually depends on uh, if the coffee is ready to be poured for the second pour. And how, ready in terms of the temperature or in terms of are you looking the, at the coffee bed to determine i'm looking at the bubbles actually and now if you're also pouring then cold water or colder water into the kettle yeah to get the temperature right yes um and how big was the second pour there you're up at 130 yeah and then later on i'll just go all the way to um 250. okay so three pours yes and now you're pouring very aggressively in the center, whereas the other pours you poured in a circle. Why, why is that? Um, because I found that with the higher, uh, when, the, when the liquids reach to a higher place in this kettle, yeah. yes, and, and the, the water flow out of the total dripper goes faster. So I actually wanted to go faster at the very end. Yeah, sure. Um, but for the previous one, I, I was actually pouring very slow yeah. um, to make it also slow as well. So mm -hmm. for that pour, I can have longer contact time yeah. for the water with my coffee grounds. Yeah. Yeah. Which is very true. I mean, I think anyone that, that practiced uh, a lot of center pours knows that a center pour uh, has the water flow through way, way quicker, yeah. which is basically just because it goes through in theory a bit un, um, uniform because yes. the water goes through the same place in the coffee bed which is basically creating a bit of a big channel yes. for lack of a better term uh, doesn't mean the coffee is not tasty uh, but technically the water goes through less coffee therefore it actually extracts faster yes. uh, it's interesting this kind of circle center pour and I'm not going to go too in depth on it but um, what I can say to any, any new people competing out there is that I would actually always finish, even if it's a circle pour, I finish that as a center pour. Yes. Uh, because it's significantly easier to finish on the right amount of water yes, when you pour definitely. In, a, in a center pour than a circle pour. So a lot of people doing center pours, you've probably seen this with people do double pouring and stuff with restricted flow. It has very little to do with taste quality and a lot simply to do with the fact that it's easier to hit your numbers. Now, Eric has taken out this huge pink thing. <laughs> what is this huge pink? Is that the decan decanter you've been talking about? No, this is not the decanter. This is a cup. Oh, this, is, this is the cup that she used. This is Emmy's cup. No, not oh. Emmy's, but uh, the champions, the, the girl from China. Who, the girl? Ah, so Eric brings out the coffee cup uh, from the girl that won the World Brewers Championship. That's cool. 
It's from origami. Um, I'm, we're just gonna put a picture in somewhere. We're not even gonna try to explain this. I mean, it's basically pink. A lot of people use pink stuff. I use pink stuff as well. Why do we use pink stuff? Well, it's because sensory science has taught us that <laughs> it will increase the perceived sweetness. Is this true? Do I agree with that? It can actually be discussed. Still, I used it in a competition as well. Yes. Uh, we did have the open highest serve. I just want to say that. Um, and so, I mean, did it work? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. It's a great cup. It looks kind of like a flower vase. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it, true. I mean that in a nice way, but it's a very high cup. Yeah. Uh, then again, I mean, it's it's competing and, and kind of what, what I want to use when I compete versus what I want to drink with on a kind of everyday yes. basis. Yes. Two different things. Yeah. I mean, I love it. We have some like more old school traditional cups then yeah. as well. Yeah. More like you know, old Swedish fika cups, <laughs> almost, right? Yeah. And I think they're amazing. Yeah. Uh, but for the sake of this podcast, let's use the fancy cup. It actually looks really pretty when I see it. <laughs> Just, Just pour the cup. Okay. So the reason why I asked Eric about the decanter is that he just served me before we did this little recording thing, two um, two different cups of coffee, brewed with the same coffee. Yes. Kind of taking me back to the the roasting workshop. Yes. Where he was like, oh, which coffee do you like the most? And I tried both, and actually could tell that it was the same coffee. Yeah. Uh, but there was one coffee that was significantly softer. Yes. Rounder. Yes. Uh, a lot more palatable, yeah. I would say. Yeah. Uh, it was a relatively heavy coffee, the other one. So this kind of really took the edge off a bit. Yeah. Um, and made it actually taste better. And that was just because you decanted it yeah. uh, before you served it. Yes. Okay, so we, we just kind of talked about the... Uh, what was the brew time there, by the way? Uh, it's 2 minutes yeah, no. and 15 seconds. 2 minutes and 15 So relatively quick, Yes. fair to say, on the yeah. quicker side. Why do we brew quicker versus longer? Oh, uh, I'm I'm grinding finer, so it actually if if we go with a longer brew and then on a finer grind setting, then we might have over extracted. Um, but this one I was trying to set a little bit even faster. Yeah, yeah. That's really cool. And how do you feel now? Because now now we're actually drinking the coffee here. Yeah. Um, I think I, we definitely didn't nail the roast of that coffee. Let's just be honest about that. We can roast that coffee better. Yeah. Um, still super sweet, I would say. Yeah. Uh, it has a lot of, especially I find the, the melon that we're yes. talking about. Yes. Um, very floral as well. I want more flavor intensity. I don't yeah. want a stronger cup of coffee. Yeah. I just want more flavor intensity. Sure. Um, which, which I think maybe you can get by just grinding coarser. Yeah. Actually. Well. Um, I think that's could be um, something worth testing yeah. with a specific cup. Cool. Um, what's your thoughts? So I, I think that yes, indeed, we are like on the over extracted part, a little bit more, a little bit too heavy for me. Um, and at the same time, I found that it's, um, I found the bitterness, um, like dark color notes, that color tones at the middle part, which made the coffee lose um, clarity. Yeah. Yeah. So my, actually, I would try to brew a little bit faster. Try it in this cup. I mean, I, I just poured this over in a new cup now, and it actually tastes a bit better. I, I will have to say though that that the, the cup that, that the girl used from China, amazing cup. <clears throat> yeah. The second you take it up and you you drink from it. You understand the function, yeah. Where it basically forces your nose deeper into the cup, true. And you get so much of the aroma experience at yeah. the same time as you get the flavor and everything else. Yeah. Um, so brewing coffee here, um, Colombian Pamukkan Geisha, uh, brewed with a little dripper, working with a one to fourteen ratio. Yes. Uh, Eighteen grams of coffee, yeah. two hundred and fifty. Two hundred and fifty grams two? of water. Yeah. But it's 250, yeah. <laughs> it was supposed to be 250. Brewed with the water with three different temperatures. Yes. Which you regulate by pouring water into a kettle. Yes. Which is pretty cool. Um, I'm going to do one brew. Yes. And we're going to talk about something that I think is very important. Yeah. We recently did a video about this as well. Um, do you want to grind this through? Yes. Do we have a grind size? 
So before we're going to talk about that important part, we're going to actually grind the coffee. Yeah. Um, so again, it's going to be a bit noisy here. So uh, what about the big red one? What's uh, that? The big red one is actually... It's the Taima, that's the compulsory grinder for the Taiwanese Yes, brewers. yes. Ah. yes. Is that, can you grind really coarse with that? Yes, actually, yes. Okay, can we use that one? Yeah, for sure. I'll show you the grind size first. Go for it. Mm. Oh, that's fine, it's not, it's not too noisy, I think. That's pretty okay. So, grind size. So, for you guys that don't know, this is a FEMA grinder. F E I M A. Um, pretty cool, I would say. Um, and it allows us to grind a bit coarser. It also looks like we're getting a pretty uneven particle distribution, which I think is perfect because that's how I like to brew coffee. Yeah. Uh, if we go a bit coarser from that, Eric, and then okay. we can just grind everything through. This is the courses. Uh, go back to a bit finer. Okay. So visually calculating grind size is not always the smartest thing to do, but to be fair, we all need to start somewhere. Um, and just by looking at the ground, it gives you a relatively good idea about what we're actually, of what we're up against. We're gonna need to get some more water, I think, as well. Perfect. Okay. Where do we have the? Oh. Should we? Should we maybe mention what we're brewing with in terms of water? Sorry. What are we brewing with in terms of water? In. This is my. Because we're brewing at my home. Yeah. <laughs> so it's well, actually. I mean, we're doing proper home brewing here yeah, for, so for the people that wonder. This is the water from uh, the filter. It is the filtered water uh, of Taipei City. Yeah. Yeah. So Taipei, uh, we're actually very lucky because the, the water here is very soft. Yeah. Uh, I think it's like 30 ppm something. Yeah. And it's just, it's perfect. It, it goes through the filter and then everything is set. Yeah. And you can brew a good cup of coffee already. That's awesome. Yeah. So uh, in terms of brewing, I'm gonna be uh, a bit obvious here and I'm gonna go for the April Brewer. Um, the April Brewer that we have launched now is quite an update from what I used in Boston. Uh, not that we weren't happy with that, but as with everything we do, we try to kind of push forward and, and make it better. Um, so for those of you that don't already have it, That was a bit louder, we apologize for that. Um, so this is a flatbed brewer still, slightly changed bottom. Uh, we have three kind of filter holders centered in the bottom to hold up the filter. Um, changing basically the circulation of the air in the brewer, which is causing the flow rate that, that we want to have. Um, and it's not so much about fast or slow, it's about creating the flow rate that generates this perfect beautiful balance in all temperatures, especially going from hot to cold, which is so important when you're competing every time, right? That you need to have a cold temperature that is, is very balanced. Yeah. So now we're just smelling this coffee. So what is this coffee? Uh, I would love to actually show you guys a picture because the green coffee looks horrendous, <laughs> right? We're yeah. here, we're gonna, um, one of the April uh, members are gonna be competing in the World Roasting Championship. Part in that is sorting out defects. So they're actually competing in how do we sort out defects from green coffee. And at the same time, um, we're basically brewing a coffee that has a tremendous amount of defects in it. <laughs> True. Um, but we all tried this coffee before and it tastes pretty good. It is really, really nice. It's actually really, really nice. <laughs> yeah. And then the question is, you know, what are we doing here? Not too long ago, we did a video about um, 
basically questioning this kind of new fermentation style, anaerobic or carbonic, call yeah. it whatever you want to, yeah. low oxygen fermentation, which is one step. But on top of that, we have also, um, are people not then using bad coffee yeah. uh, for that and using the processing to make that coffee taste better. And therefore the farmer can do less work uh, put a bit of fancy processing on it and sell it very, very, very expensive. And this is a great example of a coffee where I, when I bought this coffee, uh, it's, it's bought for one of our April athletes. Uh, we basically buy whatever they want us to buy and which we're not selling on April, but we're letting them compete with. Um, and when I bought this coffee first, I thought it was bullshit. Yeah. I opened up the sample and I looked at it and I was like, what in the world is this? Um, you have immature beans, you have broken beans, you have beautiful looking beans, uh, you have black beans, you have a wide range of a lot of stuff that you would normally sort out from, yeah. from green coffee, leaving us to believe that this is either what is over from actually a well-sorted coffee. True. Uh, hard to believe that this is intentional, uh, but apparently it is intentional. And when tasting this coffee, we're actually realizing that it is you do not want to do that. <laughs> so just just explain to the people what you just did. Um, so I used the UV light yeah. to look at the um, at the green samples. Yeah. Um, so you so with my experience that um, the coffee that after went through the the UV light sorting, and at the end you get a very very good result. Um, you don't find quakers. Um, you just basically will have a better cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. But with anaerobic processing or with with this specific bag, when I have the UV light uh, on it, it's basically just shining everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so there, it, it's a bag full of defects that taste amazing. Yeah. Uh, and this becomes really complicated, right? Yeah. And to be fair, I'm going to be honest here. I, I don't really, I haven't decided personally what I think about this yet. Uh, it's either amazing or it's it's which we've been talking about, uh, pretty scary. We're in a situation here where the green coffee world is changing. Um, we've been discussing for many, many years about the importance of clean coffees. Mm -hmm. I'm still emphasizing washed coffees as my go-to coffee always. Yeah. And here I have a natural anaerobic or lactic fermented coffee, to be fair, according to the description, with what looks to be a bunch of defect in it, uh, tasting really, really good. <laughs> What are we to make of that, right? Uh, and first of all, I think it's really important to state that a lot of these coffees, or most of these coffees that doesn't, that looks like it has a lot of defects, yeah. are actually tasting really shit. Yeah, <laughs> true. We, we had a coffee earlier today, which we do not want to go in too much detail with, but it's a really fancy coffee and people win a lot with it. And, yeah. and that tasted pretty horrendous. Yeah. Um, so it's really interesting to see this change here and, and we're not taking sides, we're just starting a discussion about it, right? Yeah. Um, what do you think about all this? Okay, so um, because I'm doing green bean business, yeah. um, so I would see things from two sides. One is from the farmer side and one is on the buyer side. So on the buyer side, I th I'm not really into this thing because you get to know that they're selling at the higher pricing and which makes our job a little bit more difficult. Yeah. And at the same time, I'm a little bit worried about this is because when everyone is doing this, it narrows down the flavor profile. It narrows down the range. Mm. So you get to find more and more similar products around the globe. And that will, at the end, make it very competitive for every farmer. Mm. It doesn't matter if you are from like a big farms or small scale farmers. Um, everyone is having the same product, then it comes back to pricing. Mm. So then they have to cut on the price again. Uh, but it will at the end benefit the bigger scale farmers as well. Um, so from the farming, from, from the buyer side, I'm a little bit worried about the result. Yeah. Um, but standing on the farmer side at the moment, I would say this is um, half a good thing because a lot of farmers around the globe around the globe is actually um, not really making this as a business, a sustainable business, mm. not making farming as a sustainable business. Mm. So increasing, um, increasing their salary or what they get, what they get 
uh, for the money is actually good for them. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say half of it I support it, but half. But in long term, I would say that I'm not really into this thing. No. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with that because farmers need more money. Yeah. At least most farmers do. There's no, there's no discussion about that, right? Yeah. That's a reality. Yeah. Um, and we need to find a situation where um, they can make more money. But then again, our soil, uh, our industry um, also needs tasty coffee. Yeah. Sure, we need a wide range of coffees. But we can't be in a situation where today less and less people want to start farming as it is, yeah. right? And on top of that, if we make farming easier and easier to make a lot of money by doing less work to some degree, yeah. moving away from sorting the coffee, um, then we're in a reality where we're only going to have anaerobic coffees, yeah. right? And I see that. And we, we both, have, we've been discussing this, Eric as a green coffee buyer, me as a, as a roaster and green coffee buyer, um, the reality is that it's harder and harder to find washed coffees. True. It's just super difficult. Yeah, I go to all of these farms. I mean, you go to way more farms than I do as an, as an importer, yeah. right? Uh, and you ask for washed coffees, and if, you know, the farmers, they just look at you. <laughs> Why do you want washed coffee? <laughs> Why natural coffee is like everyone else? Yeah. Uh, and I think that's problematic. Yeah. I think we're going into a, um, a reality, a situation where we might be losing uh, a lot of our traditions, right? And, and innovation to some degree is about also letting go, right? Yeah. Moving forward, we should do that, but I don't want to forget washed coffees. Sure. I don't want to move away from well-sorted coffee, right? Yeah. Um, that being said, I just finished brewing this coffee because we got kind of stuck talking about this. Um, just to run you through my recipe here, uh, not the one I used in Boston. Yeah. In reality, I don't really use that anymore because uh, <laughs> I think we can do better. Yes. Right? I'm not stuck in any old ways. Uh, I left my trophy in the, in the Boston River and, and got back on a plane and that's <laughs> like end of story, let's yeah. do new things, right? Yeah. Um, true story, actually. Yeah. Um, however, April Brewer, latest version, third version, Kalila filter, large size, you could have small size if you want to, yeah. uh, 20 grams of coffee, yeah. um, 300 grams of water, yeah. one to 15, very basic, very standard. Uh, I'm going to argue that I do this also because we want a lot of coffee, because we yeah. want to try this coffee. Uh, I do three pours yeah. at 94 degrees Celsius, yeah. relatively uh, higher temp than what I'm used to. Uh, it's just my experience with this coffee that it requires a bit more to, yeah. to bring in all the characters. Um, three pours, each 100 grams. Yes. So each pour 100 grams and in eight seconds, important. So the speed of how you pour water matters. It's True. not just the volume you're pouring, right? Yeah. And these are all circle pours for the first 60 gram and finish with a center pour for the last 40 grams as yeah. well. Identical on each pours. The drawdown in the end is a tiny bit slower than the first pour, uh, but we're still gonna end up around 2.30 yeah. in total brew time, more yeah. or less. Um, I don't do any bloom uh, because I don't believe in the concept of bloom, blooming because I don't brew with coffee that has enough CO2 in it yeah. from the start to actually bloom up. Yeah. A big part of that is because I'm roasting lighter than most, uh, plus we're grinding very early from brewing, yeah. which to be fair, we haven't done here, no. but I normally would be doing. Yeah. Uh, did in the World Championship as, as well. Should we, should we smell this coffee? Yes. I just did this classic, let's pour too much coffee in a cup so you can't really hold it properly. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. Yeah. Um, What is that? Yeah, I found the the color like red. And I also find berries and a little bit like melonish, but the melon is like the red watermelon. Yeah. yeah, and I found that a lot. And I also found a little bit of the cocoa nibs uh, after the smell of the watermelon. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna be really clumsy and a bit loud here and pour the coffee back into the server. One, because when you fill too much coffee in a server, you can't smell it anymore. Yeah. And I think that's really annoying. Yeah. Can we go wash it off here? So we try to smell there. Okay. Secondly, that's kind of an interesting discussion, right? We still see a lot of competitors uh, that serve the aroma uh, in the server with the argument that the aroma would be better in the server, which to some degree can be true. Yeah. I would, I would say for sure. 
Did you notice any difference? Yes. Smelling so from the server. smelling from the server, and I gave it a sword. Oh wow, that's actually quite better. <laughs> and then I found more uh, characters. So I found like stone fruit at front. I found yellowish um, filling, and also a little bit floral as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I think this. When I smell the coffee, then I can directly say that it's it's gonna be a complex coffee. Yeah. And I mean, also tasting it now, I'm gonna admit that was not. We maybe we should have gone a bit coarser, but I mean, uh, it's crazy complex. It is very complex. There's so much stuff in there, and, and yeah. the thing is, again, the green coffee looks like crap, but it's such a clean cup of coffee. It looks very bad. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest, it looks very bad. But when you drink it, you, if you don't look at the green, you'd say that it's. Um, you would. You would never imagine. That. No. You would never imagine. If I served anyone listening to this that cup of coffee. Uh, and let you kind of enjoy the whole cup and then show you the beans, you would go like, whoa, yeah. what is this? Now, everyone is asking or wondering, what is this coffee? Uh, I'm not going to tell you. Uh, and again, the reason why I'm not going to tell you is because this is an April athlete exclusive. Um, they're going to try this coffee and, and one or two of them are going to compete with it. Uh, and if they want to share this coffee afterwards, uh, that's fine for them, but we're actually not going to do it now. Uh, now, are we telling you guys to start buying really ugly looking green coffee? I don't no. think so. No. Definitely not. This is once in a lifetime. I never encountered this before. <laughs> and I tried a few of them. Yeah. Uh, and this is truly, this is a person in this industry being very good at processing. Yeah. Very, very good. True. And we're going to be happy to share <laughs> with you who this person is. Uh, after the world championship <laughs> uh, in, in Melbourne. But sure. again, it's, it's very important. I mean, I've seen roasters do videos where they're kind of explaining why their green coffee looks like shit. Yeah. And then you try the coffee and it also kind of tastes pretty shit. Yeah. And, and it's not that kind of coffee and it's not what we're trying to promote here. Uh, again, we're just kind of following on the line of coffee is changing. Yes, right? yes. Coffee experience is changing. Yeah. And we see the competitions are very much in the forefront of that, yeah. right? And we yeah. think that's super exciting. Yes. Um, and that's just kind of what we want to share with you guys here. I'm going to drink more of this coffee. Yeah. I mean, it's just a tactility. And as you say, for reference colors, you both have these kind of really, as you say, like cacao nibs, really chocolatey notes yeah. in it, which often you don't find in, in really complex coffees these days, but you also have this jasmine peachy, tropical pineapple note to it. Now I also find like the vanilla ice cream. Oh yeah, cool. it's, And it's also, you know, super, super, still super clean within all of that, which is really strange uh, to say, but it's very, very true. And I think that, again, this is, this is all why we end up competing. Yeah. to some degree, right? Yeah. Because that's where we find a lot of the really cool coffees. Yeah. Um, and I mean, to be fair, this coffee is also not that expensive. Mm -hmm. It's not It's not cheap. We're talking about roughly between 20 and 25 US dollars yeah. per kilo. Yeah. That which is, is, when you look at this quality, yeah. it's like... It's pretty, it's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty good, yeah. None of you are going to be buying, going to be able to buy it anymore because Eric is not going to buy all of it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I kind of want to buy all of it. No, I don't want to buy all of it, but I want to buy some. I, you know, we bought some of it already, but <laughs> maybe we'll buy a bit more. What else should we talk about? Is there something here we're missing? Brewing coffee, bit of competition coffee stuff. Um, you're going up competing in January, February. I think it's gonna be the end of February. End of February. Yeah, okay. It's usually calibrated with the with the lunar calendar schedule. Of course. <laughs> so what's your what's what's kind of what's up next? Uh, apart from the fact that we're going to Kenya at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm also going to be in Ethiopia after Kenya. Yeah. Um, we're gonna do some experiments with the washing station that we work with. Yeah. And which is going to be super exciting. Um, it's going to be the first time for me to be in Ethiopia. Um, I don't know, like, I mean, I'm not expecting too much uh, from my trip, but I always take down some notes when I uh, go to different regions. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people have to pay more attention to why their coffee tastes like this mm -hmm. and to have a better understanding when they visit the farms or washing stations or factories. Because you really are trying to understand why they do it, if they do it with a logical sense, but not just like 
betting on their luck. Yeah. Because you want to buy from the same producer, same quality, or, or be improving year by year. Yeah. So it's very important for you to really understand what they are doing. And if you are supporting them, then that's perfect. Yeah. So for me, like, I've been working with this uh, washing station because my teammates and my colleagues go there every year. And this year, I have a lot of questions and I want them to be solved. Mm. So at the same time, hopefully that we can have a uh, better quality year by year. So mm. that's how we do the things for sourcing. Yeah, but when I come back, I will be preparing for the competition like very, very hard. Um, I have a lot of things as test going on for the experiments. And there are a lot of things that I really want to play around with. So I really need time to do experiments. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I do have the structure already. Mm, but at the same time, it needs to be like soundproof. Yeah. I need to do a lot of experiments to test on this idea. And yeah, so hopefully in February, then I can get mm, <laughs> the champion trophy back home yeah. this time. <laughs> I mean, it's time now. I think, uh, I mean, I'm, you know, second is always the worst place, right? And I've been <laughs> True. There, right? Yeah. I know the feeling and, and um, I mean, it takes time. It takes yeah. time and it takes focus. Yeah. Um, and it takes that you wake up in the morning and, and have a good day, right? Yeah. Which is sometimes the most difficult part. Yeah. Uh, especially on that exact competition day, right? I mean, we all can brew amazing, uh, you know, coffee at home, but uh, it's competing is about who can bring it on stage at that specific time, right? Sure. It's always going to be way more complicated. It's way more complicated and it's very, very difficult. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, so we're going to wrap this up now. We've been at it for about an hour, I think. Yeah. Uh, and you guys don't want to listen to us anymore. <laughs> um, for those of you that want to know more about our April athletes, you can go into our uh, media website, read about them. They have training logs, we do videos, we do a lot of stuff. Um, you're also more than welcome to just write them and ask questions. I'm sure so some of them would like to answer. <laughs> sure. Maybe not all of them. Um, thank you guys for listening. Thank you, Eric. Thank for, you. For thank you very much. We're going to do some really awesome workshops uh, workshops roasting yeah. brewing and then a bit of brewing at the event as well yes it's, of course the taiwan coffee festival or co what do you call it um taiwan coffee show coffee show yeah. yeah uh together with the world roasting championship um awesome thank you guys for for listening thank, thank you. you from us here at april thank you for listening if you enjoyed this podcast please share with your friends family and colleagues thank you